Hello and welcome everybody. This is day two of the Business of Flight Week and I'm thrilled to have you here and I'm thrilled to welcome today's speaker. Today we are honored to have Andy Aldrin, faculty with Embry-Riddle's Worldwide Campus, sharing with us his views and an update on the commercialization of space. Andy, the floor is yours. Cool. Thank you very much, Shannon. Um, this is a real pleasure. This is like the second time I've done this. Some of you guys are already familiar with me. Um, I'm ready to go. Okay. Have to go back to you. Holy wife, now I'm sorry. <laughs> so, um, I spend most of my time talking to space cadets because I, well, I am a space cadet. Um, show of hands, how many people spend more than 25% of their time thinking about or working in space related stuff? One, two, that's awesome. <laughs> Usually there's like two people that don't. So, it's a pleasure for me. To talk to, we're still not even close to being here. To, to talk to an audience that is not space cadets, because I want to tell you a story about space commercialization that you may not have heard before. Um, so like I said, I, I am a space cadet. Those of two of you who are, most of my friends that are space cadets, did so voluntarily. They enlisted, so to speak. I got drafted <laughs> at six years old. Thank you. My dad put scuba tanks on me because he was stuttering, stuttering. He was studying how to do under, underwater training for an EVA, extravehicular activities. And I was going to be his dive buddy. And I was his dive buddy for the next 60 years. Um, and we, if any of you have met my dad, you've met him. He does one thing. He talks about space. So from the time I was six years old, I was talking about space. And I did it for the rest of my life. I busted a move briefly and became a Sovietologist. But you know what? So I'm a Sovietologist, and I, what do I end up studying? Soviet space, right? So I've been thinking about this stuff for a long time, and it's occurred to me over the years that we all think that what's going on right now is something that's new. Elon Musk is the first real commercial person in space. SpaceX is the first commercial launch company. That is not true, and that's what I'm here to tell you about. So I'm using waves as a metaphor, not because I'm a surfer, but I lived on the coast and I'm on the coast now. Is anybody here a surfer? Cool. <laughs> You're not all prophets. All right, cool. All right, so I'm going to use waves as a metaphor. We have gone through three waves of space commercialization. The first wave is the wave that kind of didn't happen. The wave that never broke. So the space shuttle was going to revolutionize space travel. We were going to launch 50 times a year at a cost of, anybody want to give me a number? $8 million a launch. $8 million a launch. We ended up launching 10 times one year, which is pretty impressive. The cost per launch was somewhere between a half a billion and a billion and a half a year. So we kind of missed that price bogey. But the thing that was amazing about the shuttle was it wasn't just the shuttle. There was a whole commercial ecosystem that was going to lurch out of the shuttle bay. We had nuclear tugs. We were going to have bases on the moon, bases on Mars, industrial space facilities. All this stuff was happening because of the shuttle. And what happened? Challenger. So that wave just kind of never happened. Then we get to the wipeout. So this is the one we all want to forget about. But in the mid to late 90s to early 2000s, we got wiped out. And it was a massive effort at commercialization, and it looked a lot like some of the stuff we see today. So we were going to darken the sky with satellites. We even had celebrity satellite providers, Bill Gates and Craig McCaw at Teledes Teledesic that was going to launch 840 satellites, which was unthinkable at the time. The launch people never miss an opportunity to build new launch vehicles. I'm, I grew up in the launch vehicle industry. It's, we never miss an opportunity to create new launch vehicles. What happened? Well, 
Whoops. That was my best transition. It all blew up. But in the sort of scheme of creative destruction, we actually ended up with something. We had a reading global star in Orcom. About $18 billion of investment. Real CapEx flying in space. Constellations that technically worked. We ended up with two launch vehicles. Atlas and Delta, that worked pretty well. What could possibly go wrong? Well, y'all went through bankruptcy is what happened. So, three constellations, 188 satellites, 18 billion of investment was sold in bankruptcy for 80 million. So there's an old saying in the early days of commercial space, you want to make a small fortune in space, start with a large one, right? Yeah, but this is ridiculous. This was painful. It was not a fun time to be a space cadet. But lurking in the background, we have SpaceX and Blue. Now, recognize that one of the distinguishing factors about these two companies is they were self-financed. The finance industry for space completely tanked. In fact, the whole VC market went from about 100 billion a year to about 20 billion a year between 2000 and 2002. It was over. So, here we are, the third wave. I like this wave because it's not really clear whether this guy's going to get a really great ride or he's going to get totally wiped out. <laughs> and that is kind of where we are today. Here's the good news. We've got two very, very rich, very dedicated people who are leading commercialization of space. Do you realize their combined work is larger than Denmark? Do you realize the space industry is larger than Denmark? We'll get into that. So these are good things. We are developing, we have created lots of new companies. The big difference between today and the past is the breadth of companies that we have. We have companies in Earth Observation, Satellite Communications, Launch, even Lunar Development, and of course, Human Space Flight. $300 billion of equity investment. Is anyone counting? You'll notice that the numbers do not add up. That is interesting. Almost $200 billion of the investment is going into your cell phone, GPS applications. Now, I'm not saying this isn't space, but when you see really huge numbers get thrown around, be aware this is where a lot of it is. Um, and in fact, these companies are kind of interesting because for the most part, they're not even paying for space, right? They get it for free from GPS. But okay, so this is our ocean. Let's go surf some waves. And what I want to do is go through some segments and we'll just see, are we tubed or are we trashed, right? Okay, first one up, small launch. Any guesses where this is going? Okay, so. I, I threw Virgin Galactic in here because I had to have Virgin Galactic and I had to have Richard Branson. What could possibly go wrong? SpaceX, Academy Space, Vir, uh, Virgin Galactic, at what point is it? 70 bucks a share, I think it's the highest. What could possibly go wrong? Oh no! They're down to, what is it now? I just did this too much a share. 95, well, actually, if you go from the very beginning of 2019, it's, they've only lost a little bit of money. But if you look at the, the highs, it was pretty massive. So it was ugly, but they're not alone. Here's the interesting thing. Um, these are, I use Astro, that's not the one I really want to use. Astro Space is a small launch vehicle company. It has gone down 96%. In fact, over the last couple of days, they basically shut their doors. Rocket Lab, which one of you is invested in? Where is this? I actually think Rocket Lab is one of the better 
managed new companies in space. But look, over the past five years, negative 55%. Sorry about that, too. Hope you didn't get in at the top. Um, and then there's Richard's company, Virgin Orbit, which is completely bankrupt. And the disturbing thing to me is Virgin Orbit actually had a focused business plan looking at selling primarily to the U.S. government. So we're, we, we are absolutely wiped out in this industry. I would, the good news about Rocket Lab is they're actually moving out of small launch. So you're okay, Chris. I think, I think, I think you'd be okay. Let's talk about telecom. Because after all, Starlink is going to change the world. Um, but here's the thing about telecom. You got to remember, SATCOM lives in a is a tree in a forest of telecommunications, and it's not a very tall tree. If you look at the performance of of Starlink, maybe you get up to 100 megabits. But if you're in an urban area, you've got 10 to 20 gigabits, and when when you get to millimeter wave 5G. You're going to have gigabit speed wherever you go. If you're in the suburban areas, I live in a suburban area. I can pull down three, 400 gigs, 400 megabits, I'm sorry, on my cell phone. Space is never going to compete with that. It's only once you get to rural, unserved areas and airplanes and, and, and naval maritime, which are interesting markets. But we've got to look, is that... Is that going to be a big enough market? How much is this market going to expand? We don't know. But here's something that's kind of disturbing. If you look at the market for space-based broadband, it's fixed. We can forget about the whole mobile thing. That's just a, that's, that just doesn't work technically. Um, but here's your market. It's declining massively. It's declining for two reasons. One reason is people are getting connected, so they're no longer not connected. The other reason is the prices are going down. Significant 50% drop over the last couple of years. So what you're left with is about a $70 billion market. This is Middle East and Africa, and there's a reason it's not connected. They can't afford it. They can't afford a constellation, which is ultimately going to cost about $200 billion. So that's telecom. I don't know if we'll wipe out or two. That's actually a metaphor for that way. We do not know what's going to happen in that. There are scenarios where I can say it makes sense. There are scenarios where I can say it doesn't. But let's talk about Earth observation. Believe it or not, there's a market I like. I do like this one. But right now, in Earth observation, what we're doing is satellite companies are selling data directly to end users like farmers. And it looks like an astronaut in the Mekong Delta. It's just, it's not an efficient way of doing things. Where things are going to go is this guy who knows something about satellite data and knows the farmers is gonna figure out how to get the best data out of space. Now the trick is, this guy does not come from the University of Sao Paulo. He works with Deloitte and Tooch. The consulting companies are going to be the ones that are going to dominate this business because they know their customer, they know data, and that is, I think, a really, really interesting market. That's tuned. Now what's uh, space mobility? This is interesting. This is basically moving things around in space. There are a few things you can do. We talk about deorbiting satellites as Debris removal. Okay, it costs about $4 billion, $4 million to deorbit a satellite. That ain't gonna work. That ain't gonna work. This is an interesting little market though. At the end of the life of a geosynchronous satellite, it has to move into what's called a graveyard orbit. So it takes about three months of fuel to put it in that orbit. You take that fuel and you fly the satellite for another three months, some satellites generate a billion dollars a year of revenue. You just bought them $250 million a lifetime. That's creating value. And you can do this for literally like um, hundreds of thousands of dollars for in cost, which is so, uh, there doesn't take any fuel to do that. 
Here's a really interesting one. You take a satellite, you launch it to low Earth orbit, and launch vehicles are really lousy at getting you from low Earth orbit beyond because they're built for flying through the atmosphere. So they got bearings, they've got structures that have to handle all the loads. It's way more efficient to just get a tug and pick it up and bring it up. So does this make economic sense? Yes, it turns out. Depending on what you're looking at, you could be 50% cheaper for the whole launch than SpaceX is today. So that's two. That's an interesting market. The real question is, how many satellites need to go to geosynchronous, geosynchronous orbit anymore? Here's another one that I don't really have numbers for, uh, but this is actually using a fuel depot to refuel the satellite. When would a satellite need to be refueled? Well, think about a reconnaissance satellite. It wants to dip down to a lower orbit and come back up, and it's burning fuel. So if you've got a billion dollar reconnaissance satellite, you're gonna need a lot of fuel. Well, refueling actually makes sense for really high value assets. So this is kind of a mixed bag. There are good ways and bad ways. Let's go to the next one. This is this is the this is the hundred foot wave here. This is the hundred foot wave. Bringing back asteroids because there are literally quadrillions of dollars in this asteroid. All you got to do is go out there, lasso it, bring it home, and you are the world's first trillionaire. What could possibly go wrong, right? Well, the thing about asteroids is it's really, really sensitive to the concentrations of the useful metal. We assume something as below 100 grams per ton. MIT said, best case, maybe we get to 100 grams per ton. And so you crunch some numbers. It literally takes you about 130 Starship launches to fuel the rocket that's going to go out and get this asteroid and bring it back. That's a lot of money. It's fundamentally a transportation problem. So you don't get to a problem with a positive net value until you get to 2,500 grams per ton, which is orders of magnitude more than what we expect. So I think we're I think I think we're wiped out on this market. So where are we? Because of the scheme of things. Am I surfing the right ways? This is a question you got to ask. And so our two surfer dudes can tell you. A surfer doesn't just, a good surfer doesn't just jump in there and look for a way. They actually look for the indicators. First thing they look for is, is there a swell coming? Good weather data can tell you whether there's a swell coming. The next thing you'll see is they sit on the shore and look at the waves. They're not lazy. They're looking to see what the sets look like. And then they go out and surf away. So the lesson for all of you that want to go space surfing is you got to pick the right waves. you got to be smart. you got to look at the underlying factors that are going to drive the space economy. Because it's not one wave anymore. There are a bunch of different things that are going on, good waves and bad waves. So that is my story. I'm sticking to it. Did anybody keep track of my time? Yes. <laughs> that was my major goal. Okay. So I've got plenty of time for questions. I've even got secret slides that I can show you if you guessed the right question. Anyway, we've got time for questions. Yes, sir. So uh, one thing that you didn't say about this policy, how is policy and the different... I don't know, the American government or the European government or the Chinese, but yeah. I don't think that thing goes those companies. Well, so first of all, I didn't say, I mean, this other commercial space specifically, but policy is, is huge. So the first thing you got to understand is the government is the biggest customer. And and if one wave that is a great wave to serve, particularly right now, is Space Force. They're growing. They're reliable customers, all good stuff. Regarding policy itself, what are the big issues? Um, there are two issues that are huge. One is how do you manage debris in space? 
And that is going to be a government function. But I'll tell you what, um, it's not going to be easy. Yeah, do you want to follow up on that? So the thing is, it's not one government. And it, it's very uncertain, right? They're looking at like degree. Okay, is it an American degree? Is it a Chinese degree? You, how how you, do you enforce it? That's the problem. That is the problem. Like we will enforce it when all of the governments get together and and unify each other. And um, I had, I it wouldn't even a professor, a teacher told me once that we will do that when we fire a rocket at the moon and the moon fires back. And this is before my dad once, not to, it's just after my dad once at the moon. I said, you know what, we tried that, it didn't work. So yeah, you're right. It, this is this is a huge thorny problem. How do you get somebody to pay for it? How do you get somebody to let? Are, are the are the are we going to let a Chinese tug come and grab our debris? I don't think so. So um, though it, this is a huge thorny problem that we don't have an answer to. One thing I can tell you is I actually did some calculations. Um, removing debris actually saves a lot of money because right now a satellite will execute about ten maneuvers a year to orbit to move to miss debris, they actually burn a fair amount of fuel doing that. And if you start looking at huge constellations of 40,000 satellites, you're starting to look at billions of dollars of fuel spent every year, and it gets worse as you get more congestion, it gets worse as you have, well, it gets better actually, as you get better um, warning time, so you can actually spend less fuel every time you get a warning. So um, that's sort of the good news, but this is a problem that um, I don't think we will get rid of the debris. I think the best we can do is manage it, and it's going to take governments acting in ways they just haven't been able to do ever. Yes. Question. What are your views on the exploration of space and the emphasis that's being put in it right now to put people back on the moon or go to Mars and how is that going to drive the space program? I mean, in reference to the funding four thousand for this. Yeah, it's a really good question. So, first thing you have to understand about budgets and NASA's budget and the human space flight budget in particular is it's an entitlement program. Half of NASA's budget is going to go to human space flight. So, and that's just the reality. The question becomes: Are they going to spend that money wisely? And, and I'll tell you right now, no. The, the answer is. Building the rockets we're building right now doesn't really make a lot of sense. However, um, it doesn't take a huge change. I think if we focused what we were doing on determining whether or not you can actually get resources from the moon and use them in space, forget about bringing them back to Earth. That doesn't make any sense. Use them in space. Um, then all of a sudden we actually get an economic payoff off of all this exploration stuff. Do you need people there? Yeah, you probably do ultimately you need them to fix robots. But um, if, if you were going to be completely homo economicus running a government, I don't know if that's the way you spend your money. It's probably not how you spend your money, but there are good arguments for doing human space life that have to do with um, national prestige and things. I'd, you know, human space where it's like a sort of like art. If you're really, really, really rich, you buy really nice art. And so the U.S. is pretty rich, so we buy human space flight programs. Europe doesn't really care about human space flight. I don't know, but I like that word you use. Okay. Anything else? Yeah. We heading towards like the, uh, I guess, commercial aviation business, which has to really rely on two commercial airplane suppliers towards a duopolistic market in the commercial launchers, or are we more likely to be oligopolistic? It's hard to say, because Especially 10 years ago, 10 years ago, we had one launch provider in the US. Question. Yeah. Trickiest question. Oh, I'm sorry. Question was, are we moving toward a sort of duopoly? We only have a very limited number of players in commercial space. Um, so we'll always have two because I, I think for the foreseeable future, the US and China will be in space, whether they're commercially or not. Um, but 
an interesting thing has happened because if we go back 10 years ago, as ULA announced it, we only had one launch provider. We only had one human spacecraft provider Boeing. And so we have moved a long way from that. In fact, what I argue right now is we have an over we have an overabundance of potential suppliers. And so they're going to be real shakeouts, real shakeouts. You realize in the small launch industry, if you read that chart carefully, there are 100 companies building small launchers. The market can support three. And I actually did the research to figure that out. So there are going to be huge shakeouts, uh, which is a which could be a really good thing if you're a vulture cap capitalist. There will be opportunities out there, great talent, great opportunities. But we're so to end to get to your question, it's gonna it's gonna be really unstable for a while, but we'll probably end up with relatively limited numbers because I think you know if you look at it, you sort of do a quarters five forces on the space market. You would say it's not really not a great market. And high barriers to entry, so you probably end up with a limited number of providers in this market. We had a conversation about this during lunch yesterday. But from your perspective, do you foresee in the foreseeable future in the industry, uh, either leasers or airlines or other large companies starting to buy into these rocketry companies? Um, that it has their name or to start selling the potential ride in the future? You sort of like United and Boom. Yeah. Um, so inter interesting historical digression. Um, back in the first one, shuttle commercialization, there was a bunch of airline pilots that created a thing. I it was ASAP, and I forgot what the acronym meant. They wanted to fly the show. And I know this because they used to come to our house and bug my dad. Um, that obviously didn't happen. Um, but the real driver of that is going to be tourism and then maybe point to point. Tourism, I don't know. It's really hard to say. I think a reasonable case could be made that there's a pretty good suborbital tourism market. Uh, orbital tourism, um, 50 billion is a big chunk of change. And it's not, the cost of launch isn't going to come down to the point where it's going to be $100,000 to build to do suborbital. I don't, I don't care what Elon says. That's just not going to happen. So I don't see that getting to that point. Suborbital. We were just talking over lunch about point to point. At some point in the future, you will have some kind of hypersonic point to point, but you're not. The, the idea that Starship can fly from one point to another, just what are you going to plant Starship at LaGuardia and you're going to fly it to, I don't, I don't know, um, what is the airport in the Emirates? Actually, you can probably get away with it in the Emirates. Um, you're going to fly it to um, Singapore and land it there. And so you got this 150, you got this 100 ton. Starship that just landed there, which I don't know how you would do that. And now you got to get it back some way. Um, I it just that one doesn't make sense, but you could easily see um, some kind of sort of quasi what we used to look at were things called combined cycle engines, where it starts out as an air breathing engine, then it becomes a rocket engine when it gets above the atmosphere, something like that. But that's that's decades away. And that'll be cool. I probably won't be around, but enjoy it. So you can get a job flying out, and that'll be one of them, sure. Yeah. You just briefly talked on orbital space tourism, which isn't really a thing right now, but you have companies like Axon flying private astronauts for other countries. Do you think that research in lower Earth orbit and maybe even manufacturing in lower Earth orbit can be a viable market? Don't know. Absolutely don't know. Um, Here's what I do believe very strongly that for the research market to happen in low Earth orbit, we got to get our heads out of space. We got to stop being space cadets, talking to space cadets about doing stuff in space. Um, the people that matter for that are going to be the CTOs of Merck, of Intel, of AMD, NVIDIA. Those are the ones that have the, the decabillion dollar research budgets. And that for them, the space station is just another lab. And so when we can sell them the space station as being a more efficient place to do research than, I don't know, Stanford University, then we might see some, some kind of a market develop there. And I think it could. We just, we have to kind of, the, the most difficult challenge we have right now, I think, is hiring more um, industry executives 
into the space business that actually understand that industry. Because I, I don't know anything about that business. You'd be a fool to hire me to run that business. It's like if, if there is a company which is doing stuff in space, trying to do manufacturing in space that is run by a space cadet, run like the wind. The other direction. Because you need a company that's run by somebody that is used to running an industrial laboratory and making a profit. Because that's all a space station is. Or the commercial stations that are coming up. And, and I think that can happen. I really do. Um, and so that's going to be that's going to be some business opportunities for people, but it's you know it's going to be people that that understand fundamentally what the customer needs and how to get it from space. But it starts with understanding what the customer needs. So, just a question. So, you're saying do the research and development in space, but you're not saying do the production and the operation or something like that. I, you know. But yeah, I am saying that. Ship development and things like that. You I, know, I can I can see that being yeah, I am saying that because it's you know, you think about a billion dollar fab and you're gonna put that up in space. I mean, it could I, I know there are people that are doing that, and there are real benefits, less on the microgravity side, because we can figure that one out. There are more benefits in terms of the very high vacuum, but you know, it's still it's still gonna be. At, at best, even if you talk about starship numbers, realistic starship numbers, you're still talking two thousand dollars a kilogram to get something up there, and that includes not just your waivers. That includes a whole fab, and then you got to get it back down, which costs you something. So right off the top, you've got you've got a ten thousand dollar a kilogram transportation cost, and you've got to balance that against producing something of similar quality that you know literally costs. 20 bucks a kilogram to ship across the world, right? So I, I, there's just barriers. I'm not saying it won't happen, but let's look at what the barriers are. There's another one. Yes. I have a question regarding the industry in the case where Boeing in their space program um, is uh, obviously partnered with NASA and the government. Could you see um, uh, the opportunity for the government to begin to shift away from Boeing, as you're saying that there's obviously a need in the country to be able to go to space, and with the levels of Boeing's kind of woes right now, technical uh, mismanagement, and other things, do you feel like the United States would you consider an alternative to Boeing? Uh, open disclosure, I work for Boeing for a while. Um, <laughs> a lot of stock, which pains me. Um, well, yeah, well, the answer is of course, it's already happened. In fact, I would. Would not be surprised if put it a little bit differently. I think it's entirely possible Boeing will not be in the human space like this in 10 years. Um, they, it, it's, NASA is making it harder, and Boeing is making it harder on themselves um, in, in that industry. So, absolutely. But I think there will be, there will, NASA will always want to have one semi reliable contractor. And I, I don't think they're quite there with SpaceX yet, um, but that's kind of where we're headed. Um, so yeah, I can see that happen. Um, it, it kind of depends on the industry and the specific program. So if if you're like the Space Force and, you, and you're building the prolifer proliferated warfighter architecture, uh, in which case you've got many companies participating, probably, I don't know if it's got to 10 yet, um, then you can afford to take risks with companies like SpaceX. And actually, this the Space Force is taking a lot of risk with a bunch of new companies like Spire, like Black Sky, really interesting companies. Um, so that works. But when it gets to be something which is um, a critical national asset where you can only afford one or two, um, NASA will probably always want two contractors in human space flight. And and that's not a matter of national um, existence, but having reliable contractors for things like uh, secure communications and reconnaissance sure. is a matter of national in interest, and the government will not settle for a situation in which they don't have real reliable suppliers. And so whether, whether Boeing will be one of those, I don't know, but I can almost promise you that Lockheed, Lockheed and Northrop will be among those. And they're, 
they're playing a little game with cat, cat and mouse with the government right now. Both, well, actually, Boeing and and Northrop had said they were not they're not doing any any more fixed price development contracts because they lose money. And um, I don't think Lockheed has made that declaration, but I'm sure they're talking about it in the boardrooms. And so they they're going to play chicken, and at some point. The government will say no for certain things we have to have a cost type contract and they're starting to say that so the the short answer to your question is we will there will always be a place for the bigs as we call them what's going to be really interesting is going to to be which ones of the smaller companies survive because they all won't there are just too many of them in in communications particularly in earth observation but the opportunity for all of you is to take advantage of that proliferation of systems, of sources of data, of job opportunities. I mean, at this stage in your career, you should think really seriously about just hopping on the roller coaster of working for a company uh, like Spire or Black Sky. Some of my students are going there and they, they know full well in six months they could be out of a job, but in six months they will move from a cubicle to, a, to a, a senior manager position or something like that. And they'll build the resume that they need to build great careers. And so for all of you, it's a great, great opportunity for investors. I think there's going to be great opportunities as a shakeout happens. For the rest of it, it's going to be kind of a wild thing to watch. I'm just delighted. I just get to sit here and talk about it. <laughs> right. I got no dog. I got no dog at this fight. How have you reshaped your educational program? to take advantage of uh, space. So I really started this program at, uh, in about first thoughts, let's say 2016, 2017 at Florida Tech. And, and it was specifically focused at training people who wanted to, to come into the industry. It was the Center for Space Entrepreneurship. Um, left Florida Tech and coming here, there were a lot of things that shaped my thinking. Um, so one is I thought there were tremendous opportunities for people coming out of the military, coming out of aviation, coming out of other industries that want to understand space. And so I believe that we needed to reach beyond just entrepreneurs. Um, I believe that there's enough going on that it's creating real interest. And so I wanted to create a program that was accessible. And it just so happened that I came to Embry Riddle and was looking to do something. And I said, Yeah, maybe we can have you teach a course. And then a couple of weeks later, I said, Well, by the way, we want you to create a new program. And so we did. And the worldwide program um, is interesting in lots of ways. So, first things first, <clears throat> two years, we've got 700, it's a graduate program. We've got 750 students, fastest growing program, I am told, at Embry Riddle, um, which is all nice. The part of it that matters to me is I, we're not we're only getting our first grads out, so I don't have employment numbers yet. But what matters to me is the quality of the work I get from my best students is the best I've ever seen. And so doing and I'll also say the other thing is asynchronous online course development and teaching is really, really hard. It's really, really hard for me. It's really, really hard for you, the students. But the work that comes out of it is just astonishing. I think we can do a lot more to grow it there. And so, um, and to be honest, there's a little bit of coincidence that I just, um, I came and talked to certain people and they were running worldwide and I said, okay, this really sounds cool to me. And I got to move to Florida, um, which I thought was a cool thing because I live in Colorado. Um, so that, that's kind of what shaped the development of the program. The fact that we've got 750 students is astonishing. Um, by the way, we are developing a new program we're rolling out in the fall. It's called a Master of Science in Space Systems. And what that is focused on is program management. What I program management, what I say is it's teaching you how to conceive, develop, and execute the architecture of trade studies that you need to do to be an effective program manager. Because ultimately, those are the most important decisions you have to make. You can go to engineering school, you can learn how to to do all the equations and all of that stuff. But we're trying to teach you how to ask the right questions, right? And execute this. So I'm super excited about that program that will be rolling out in the fall. Not that I want to take four G students from you. <laughs> <laughs> I know, Shannon, I'm not going to take any of your students <laughs> away anyway. Some of my students are going to go out and go to work and come back.
<laughs> All right. Yes. Curious on your views. Um, you know, sending satellites up or you know harvesting energy, if you will, from space, large solar farms that harvest energy and beam that back to, to Earth. Is that is that viable as part of the commercialization in your view? Well, sure it is. But the question is, um, there's a long and winding road to get there. The biggest challenge with space-based solar power is mass. And so even with a starship, you're not going to get down to the kind of mass numbers you need. You probably need to produce the materials. Because I mean, you're talking about platforms that are kilometers long. You probably have to produce them robotically in space. You probably really want to get the resources from the moon because it's super efficient to get resources from the moon and, and take them to geosynchronous. Uh, rather than having to take them all the way to low Earth orbit. Uh, so I think, I think that's probably going to happen, but I think it's a ways away because that's a lot of infrastructure that you've got to have. You've got to have space dubs, you've got to have autonomous systems that can literally build kilometer long satellites. You've got to have a train, you have to, have to be able to find stuff on the moon, mine it, and bring it out, process it, and bring it out. That's just a lot of stuff. But at some point in somebody's lifetime in this room, that's probably going to happen. I mean, it's there are arguments about whether technically it works, but it, the case seems pretty compelling. It's just, you know, um, a good idea at the wrong time is still a bad idea. It is. I would spent decades telling my dad that he still doesn't believe me. He's 94. <laughs> um, but it's true. I mean, really, timing is a, is a huge part of any business plan. The example. What? The iPad. The iPad. Yeah. Right. Right. I mean, I mean the, the world is littered with great ideas at the wrong time, but with bad businesses. Yeah. He got he had Santa. He's younger than you. Yeah. Okay. What you're saying, what um, like in the 60s, 70s, 80s, we were able to land and do a bunch of really good. Um, intermissions. Now we're seeing a lot of new technology coming out, and we're trying to go back to the moon in small steps. But I think out of the past eight landers on the moon, only two of them have been so successful. Yep. yep. So do you feel like right now we're trying to use new technology and new methods with aging um, ground bases here on Earth? And no, no, that's not the problem. Um, I, we're not sure what the problem is, but we've seen this movie before. There was a thing back in the 90s called Faster, Better, Cheaper, when in response to really big, expensive satellites, uh, NASA administrator Dan Golden came up with the idea that we're going to build satellites faster, better, cheaper. And most of the engineers looked at each other and go, yeah, okay, well, we're good with that. How are you going to do that? Uh, and we had, I, I forget the numbers, but I want to say out of, let's say, 16 satellites, I think there were seven or eight failures. And, and NASA's typical failure rate, particularly for space science, is, is very low. So it was, a, it was an ugly time. But what came out of it was kind of a development of a new way of running NASA science programs, um, which that's it's a whole nother lecture, but which really works. And the way we do competed science missions right now is really great, but it was a painful period of time. And so I wonder, whether we're going through the same kind of transition. And I think it's not about technology. What it turns out, the problem with Faster, Better, Cheaper was we tried to cram too much stuff into a satellite. It was There's a very strong relationship between failure rates and the level of complexity in a satellite and you pile schedule pressure on top of that and you end up with huge failures, which is what we're doing today, right? So I, I think you're going to see kind of a repositioning of that. Um, and that'll create some opportunities, but I, um, I think cool things will come probably. But that's kind of what I see. Thank you. So, how do you view the long-term viability of the Starship? <laughs> I don't know. Here's what. Here's the thing. It is, in order for it to work, it requires a really fundamental paradigm shift. It's too big to make sense right now. Do you realize that if they launch that thing 
uh, 50 times a year, I think it's a year and a half, they would launch as much mass into space as we have launched since the beginning of time. Um, the entire Starlink constellation, I'd have to read your work these numbers, but I think it, it takes them two years to launch it out. Um, and so what do you do with all that mass, right? What, what do you do with 150 tons of stuff? Well, so it's easy to say, you know what, we're now taking, it's not, we're out of the pickup truck business, we're doing semis. Okay, well, the thing about semis is you need roads, you need warehouses, you need little trucks, you need a whole bunch of stuff in space which isn't there. And so I think if you had magically had that infrastructure, then a, star, a, a starship starts to make sense. Um, without it, it's just another big, really expensive vehicle because the cost of starship is a function of staff. And SpaceX has got 12,000 people. And so you just divide what their cost is by the number of launches, add some materials onto it, and that's your cost. And so if you're only launching two times a year, it's going to be a billion dollars a launch. And so um, the other thing is just if you had to think of a more challenging way to go to the moon, it would be with something like Starship. Remember, we got to the moon by building a really, really small, lightweight vehicle that landed on the moon and completely overturned von Braun's on our, our, excuse me, architecture. And that worked. Well, Starship weighs dry mass, 100 tons. The space shuttle weighed 68 tons. It's kind of great. You're 100 feet in the air. And so I just look at it and go, it takes 16 refueling missions just to send it to the moon and back. 16, 16 Starship missions. And so I, I'm sorry, I kind of look at it and I go, what on earth were you thinking? And I, don't get me wrong, it's an amazing technical feat. And maybe it will, it, it, it may well be the right answer to replace SLS. I mean, the good news for, for SpaceX is the competition really, really, really sucks. Because <laughs> you remember the last time SpaceX competed, they competed with my company. I worked at ULA. We sucked a little, but we didn't suck nearly as bad as, as NASA and SLS. I mean, and, and uh, so I think there's a reasonable case that could be made to say SpaceX should take over the heavy lift for NASA at a reasonable discount to what SL does. Because NASA's got, it's going to be spending like $3 billion a year on SLS related stuff. And $3 billion a year would give you a pretty nice SLS program, not SLS, Starship program. Maybe you, you cut them down to $2 billion or something. And that makes sense. And, and maybe that's what they're thinking, but I don't really think, I think they really believe the Mars thing. I don't even get me started on the Mars. The next person is going to ask that, aren't they? <laughs> first person to land on Mars? What? Going to be the first person to land on Mars? Yeah. God, no. Yeah. No, I'd go to the moon. I would know. No. I mean, you realize your shortest trip to Mars is two years. I. And there's no beer. <laughs> You would probably have to make your own. I mean, you'd have to. You'd have to figure that out. Hey, we are digressing. More, I, I got nothing else to do. So, hey, uh, conversation. Explain to me how dependent our entire banking system, in particular, is upon the GPS network. Right? Um, and you pointed out that it was a potential target. And uh, in terms of anyone who wanted to attack our financial system in the event of some sort of hot uh, conflict. I guess my question to you is uh, how robust or fragile is that GPS system uh, to some sort of attack? Um, and uh, do you know if anybody's been thinking about this uh, and other than identifying that vulnerability and what? What all that means because uh, it certainly uh, caused me to have to watch the rest of the Okay, you can relax. Just take a deep breath. Take a deep breath. 
Um, so we've worried about this for a long time. And GPSs are, are pretty hardened, but somebody could take them out. Um, and you'd have to take out quite a few before I think you'd really start to degrade the banking system. So you'd have to look at that. But the good news is a bunch of other countries are stupid enough to build their own systems, right? Because they don't need it. We're giving this stuff away. But Europe insisted on having their Galileo system. Russia, of course, had blown us. And, and China's now got by due. And, you know, you hear about other countries. Uh, the UK is talking about some kind of iridium-based thing or something. I don't know. Um, so lots of people are going to be providing that data, and you pretty much have to provide it for free. So I think there's a robust set of, unless every country, if somebody blows off a nuke in space, like the Russians are talking about doing, which is a really interesting story. Um, yeah, then I, I don't know if GPS is hard enough to risk to to survive, let's say, a, a nuke in Leo or Geo, um, and I'd probably have to shoot myself if I did. Um, but so I, I actually think we've thought a lot about that piece of infrastructure. Infrastructure GPS is a, it is. I think you could make a really strong case, with a possible exception to the highway network, that this is the most valuable thing the government of the United States has ever created, because uh, it keeps just like. You guys saw two hundred billion dollars of investment. If you look at the market for GPS apps, it's over three hundred billion dollars a year in twenty thirty one. Three hundred billion dollars a year of GPS apps, and it's free. It's astonishing. So I, I, I actually, I don't. There are a lot of things about space debris and other things that I do worry about, and I do worry about deterrence in space. But because you know you've got thirty of those things out there on our own, and you've got Galileo, which I'm, I don't know what the number of Galileo is, but it's it's getting to that. It has similar service, and so it would. Um, I think a lot of other things would have to be going really, really, really badly for that to happen. Probably the last thing you're going to worry about is whether you've got your ATM machine works. Um, no, sir. Okay. So in. In line of that, though, I know waking up over the next three or four months, we're hitting the solar flare maximum for like the past, uh, I guess, like 70 or 80 year cycle, is what they're saying. Yeah. Um, now, 70, 80 years ago, we didn't have the constellations that we do now. Do you foresee or are they talking about potential blackout periods for us first, or maybe you know, the GPS satellites going out, or those new Starlinks that are going up? Do we see it? Yeah, so. Right? Um, this is a real danger, but most satellites are pretty well hardened to that kind of EMP. I don't know if, I know they're hardened to the kind of EMP you'd be talking about from a nuke going off in space, and I don't know how different that is from, let's see if we had a coronal mass ejection. I think solar flares are not that big a deal. Um, so I think for the hardened assets, that's not an issue, but I won't be at all surprised if we start to lose things like geosynchronous communication satellites, stuff that's outside of the Van Allen belts will be particularly vulnerable, obviously. And um, so I wouldn't be surprised if we have a really bad event that you start to see commercial satellites going down. You may even see things like NOAA weather satellites going down. But as far as hardened assets like GPS, first of all, GPS is, is in the middle of the Van Allen belts and kind of a weird protected spot. Um, but yeah, I wouldn't worry about GPS, but I, or protected comm. But I would say that GPS comm could be problematic. Starlink less so, just because they're at such a low altitude, so they've got some protection. But it's, maybe there's problems here. I doubt Starlink is very hard. Uh, from your last knowledge, sir, do you have any ideas or recommendations on how to clean up space debris? No. <laughs> I don't. I mean, it's really hard. We actually have a class in our program where the project for students is um, is cleaning up the grid. And so the problem is not technical. We know how to do various things and clean up a lot of it. Uh, the problem is this. But who mentioned it? Someone mentioned that it's really political. Yes. It's, it, it figuring out how to get someone to pay for it is a real challenge. It's, it's, it's a collective action problem. So... That, I think the best we're going to do on debris is figuring out a way to limit the damage we do in the future. 
but I think, like I said, at one point or another, we are talking about as many as 58,000 satellites being launched over the next decade. And that, that more than doubles the amount of large chunks of debris that we have in space right now. That, and that's, that's an issue, it's a big issue, and we don't have good answers for it. Technically, we can figure it out. Economically, politically, um, One more question. I wore you guys out. I can still go for another couple more questions. All right, listen, thank you all very much. Um, it's been, I, I enjoy doing this stuff, so you can invite me back anytime soon. Thank you, Andy. Love having you here. Love having the audience participation. Hope to see you all tomorrow when we host Sergio Aguero, our CEO and president of GoGo -Go Aviation. So you wanna talk about how you get that Wi-Fi in your airplane? Come talk to GoGo. -Go. We'll see you then.